this check, the Stoiber Review, um, um, came from, where people have fought so long, trade unions and, um, and NGOs of all varieties have struggled for years and years um, to um, produce a regulatory framework which is actually going to protect the living world, to protect people's rights at work, to protect people's rights at home, um, to prevent us from being exploited um, and, and ill-treated by the corporate elite. Um, and the, the threat was, and, and it seems in some cases to be narrowly averted, and not in all cases, was really to try to pull down um, sorry, the, can you speak into the sorry, microphone? It was really to try to pull down the whole thrust of those regulatory protections um, and um, to, to um, destroy decades of um, highly effective campaigning to make sure that actually our rights were respected on a whole range of areas. And nowhere is that trend clearer than with the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP. Um, had you devised a conspiracy against the public interest, you could scarcely have come up with anything better than that. We, we stumbled across the, what few details are now in the public domain almost by accident after discovering that for several years corporate lobby groups on both sides of the Atlantic working through, on, on the one hand the European Commission, on the other hand the US government, had been stitching up this extraordinary deal to effectively bypass sovereign parliaments um, and ensure that law was made effectively instead by an offshore tribunal of corporate lawyers accountable to no one with no rights of appeal and all the rest of it. To engage in a process also they call regulatory cooperation, which means driving down public protections to the lowest common denominator on either side of the pond. Um, and we, we, we slowly have stumbled across detail after detail about it, and everything we find out about it casts the European Commission in an even worse light than before. That it's, it's been operating behind our backs, pursuing a dialogue in which we have no part at all, and doing so very clearly at the detriment to the common purpose which is meant to lie behind the whole thrust of European Union policy. And now we discover it's already done that, um, it's it's, it's uh, completed negotiations for a deal with Canada on very similar lines, effectively tying us already into the um, NAFTA system in North America, which has been so devastating to workers' rights and to, and to the living world. And it's done almost nothing to reach out to people and say, here's what we're discussing, here's what the implications might be, you might want to get involved. It, 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 uh, permitting public engagement in this process has been like pulling teeth. And only when there's been a huge public fuss have they conceded that there should be anything remotely like a consultation, that any of the key negotiating documents should be put into the public domain, um, or half put into the public domain. Um, and even when they've had massive petitions and a wholly negative response from the public, they still seem determined to plow on with what they were doing before. Talking of ploughing on, another crucial issue which has received almost no coverage at all in the entire referendum debate is um, the use of 40% of the European Union's budget. Do you know what, what, what that, that largest budget item goes to? It goes to what we call farm subsidies, but they should really be called land subsidies because you get them for only land. Uh, for only or leasing land, and the more you earn or lease, the more subsidies you have. With the result that this is one of the most regressive allocations of money in recent human history. Uh, 55 billion euros a year are extracted from the taxpayers of Europe and stuffed into the pockets largely of the very richest people, not only here, but also elsewhere. If you look at Britain, for example, large tracts of our land here are owned by Russian oligarchs, by um, Saudi oil shakes, by Texas mining bans, and some of these people are receiving hundreds of thousands of pounds a year of our money just for the privilege of having them own land in this country. And the same applies across the rest of Europe. Um, uh, the same goes, of course, for our indigenous landowners, where the <coughs> Westminster takes a billion pounds a year, where Lord Sutton takes a million and a half, where Ian Duncan Smith's wife 
But this is the man who imposed the benefits cap on ordinary recipients of Social Security. His wife was giving 150,000 still is 150,000 pounds a year in Social Security in the form of farm subsidies because she'd inherited an enormous estate. This is a grotesque injustice, and it's compounded by something even worse. In order to claim these subsidies, your land has to be what is called in agricultural condition. You don't actually have to be producing any food in it. It has to look as if agriculture is taking place there. You could do it just by mowing it every so often. And to be in agricultural condition, it must not contain what the Commission calls permanent ineligible features, which you and I know as wildlife habitat. The, among the features are listed woodlands, regenerating woodlands, which are called dead scrubs. That would be a bad thing. Ponds, reed beds, rivers wider than four metres wide, hedgerows wider than four metres. Just about every single feature which could possibly harbour wildlife has to be eliminated if you are to take those subsidies. I've recently returned from Romania where there are hundreds of thousands of hectares of wood pasture swarming with the kinds of birds which have been pretty well eliminated in this country. There are cuckoos in every single tree. They are flying around in flocks, literally flying around in flocks. Never seen anything like it. I saw golden orioles, black woodpeckers. I nearly walked into the backside of a wild boar. There are, there, it was, uh, uh, there are nine, all nine species of European woodpeckers could be found within a five square kilometer area of where I was. It's an, an amazing place. The whole lot is now being destroyed as a result of this one instance of bureaucratic thoughtlessness. Across the European map, the Union now, literally millions of hectares, possibly tens of millions of hectares of prime wildlife habitat are, 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 are in the process of being destroyed solely so that people can take this public money. As an environmental disaster, it ranks with the fires in Indonesia and the disappearance of the world's coral reefs. No one's talking. Where are the environment NGOs? Where are the conservation NGOs? We've gone silent on this. It's an extraordinary thing. And so, when you look at it in this light, you have what appears to be a very powerful argument for getting out of here. And it would be if it weren't a case of jumping out of a frying pan and into the fire. Because when you look at, at the UK, by comparison, on every single one of those camps, it is even worse than what is going on in Brussels and Strasbourg at the moment. The conspiracy against the public, if you like, on behalf of this nexus of, of wealth and power, corporate money and the plutocrats and the plutocrats getting together with the politicians basically to stitch things up in their interests and against our interests. And Britain now looks increasingly like a semi-offshore mafia state controlled by a city of London which has no qualms at all about laundering money for drugs barons uh, and uh, for traffickers and, and for terrorists as HSBC was caught red-handed doing um, uh, and, and the immediate result was that the head of HSBC became a minister who was put in the House of Lords and was turned into a minister by David Cameron. We see our property, our, our housing stock in this country used as one big roulette table um, where people are excluded from good housing because housing is primarily there now for speculation and those who control the <coughs> speculative processes then take their ill-gotten gains and dump them offshore as the Panama Papers have recently revealed out of the purview of both police and tax inspectors. Uh, th this is a state which is completely out of control. And those who wish to take us out of Europe, they say, we want to take our country back. Yeah, it's about 1925. Um, this, is, this is an attempt to create an even more um, dangerous situation for the public interest than that over which the European Union prevails. And, and that's especially poignant when you consider that countries do not exist without alliances these days. Or well, if they do, they end up like North Korea. And, and, and what will happen, unquestionably, is that if Britain comes out of Europe, it strengthens its links with the United States. And a cheery prospect at the moment, as you can imagine, but it basically means that whether formally or informally, we become a de facto member of NAFTA, the North, 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 North American Free Free Trade Area. And that's even worse than being part of TTIP. This is, this is a, a, a devastating prospect. So, I, I bring you no comfort here. Um, 
if, if we are to, to um, stay within the European Union, which I would be voting in with, um, with, with, without any great enthusiasm, but if we are to stay in, it must be a